Well, hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I'm Richard and this is Lap of the World, your home for road trips and race tracks. And for once, I think for the first time rather since February, that's no bait and switch. I am in fact in the midst right now of finishing my tech checklist on the NSX in anticipation of an actual track day. Uh, I will be headed up this coming weekend to Waterford Hills Road Racing Circuit in a town of the same name just north of Detroit, Michigan for what will hopefully be a fun day and a little bit less humidity than what we're feeling here in Tennessee right now. Uh, I'm pretty sure I broke a sweat walking from my front door to my garage just now. It's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> anyhow, as I was going through my tech checklist, I realized kind of as I was futzing around the garage that I had all of the necessary visual aids to cover the topic that we're going to talk about today, which is the circle of life of your brick. I say circle of life of your brake rotors, really it's the circle of life for your track used brake rotors. Uh, this is not going to be the same uh, failure modes and points as your daily driver rotors. But what we're going to cover is indeed the kind of life cycle of a track used brake rotor, how it degrades, how it eventually fails, uh, some things you can do to extend that life cycle to an extent, as well as covering my own personal philosophy in the economics of buying brake rotors, um, <laughs> which some may or may not agree with, your mileage may vary, but without any further ado, let's jump into it. Getting started, I whipped the rear wheel off of the NSX because most of the rotors I have today are in fact rears from the NSX. But uh, starting out here, we have a brand spanking new rotor. I haven't even hosed the packing oil off of this because I'm going to put it back in a bag and take it as a spare to the track this weekend. There's nothing very exciting here, but uh, this is just what a pristine rotor looks like. It has never seen a pad um, <laughs> or a fingerprint for that matter as yet. Were I to need this rotor, I would dutifully spray it down with some brake parts cleaner and bed it in before trying to do anything too serious with it. But with that out of the way, let's move on to the rest of our life cycle. Moving on to phase two of the rotor life cycle, we have a rotor more or less in the prime of its life. It has been thoroughly bedded in and has a very even transfer layer of pad material smeared around it, but as yet shows no signs of wear or degradation. There are no micro cracks or other, um, any other abnormalities about it at this point in time. It is ready to go. In phase three of the rotor life cycle, this is where we actually start to see some visual evidence of rotor degradation. After enough of the harsh heat cycling typical of track use, you will start to see visual evidence, such as down here on the bottom, you'll note the light checking and inconsistent surfaces. And if you look in close on this, and I'll show you a, uh, I'll put a close up as an overlay here, you can start to see some little micro cracks or spidery looking cracks start to form. And this means that the rotor is getting towards the end of its life. Now, this rotor in particular, would I still run this rotor? Sure, I would take this as a spare, uh, no problem, because it is still fully functional as long as, you know, ignoring the surface rust and things like that. Uh, you know, if you scuffed it back in, it would work just fine, but it would have a higher risk of cracking than a rotor that's brand new or in the prime of its life. Which brings us to phase four, or the end of the rotor's life. As you can see, this one is utterly spent, has two significant cracks in it, one up here and one down here. Uh, and you don't want to know what phase five looks like because that's where the rotor comes completely in half or uh, starts shedding parts of itself inside your wheel, and that's uh, never any fun. The uh, way to pay attention for something like this happening, there is an intermediate, I'll call it phase three and a half, and I can show you that a little bit here with uh, once we're done. But my rotors typically have gone from phase three straight to being pretty significantly cracked. And the good news is I, I have enough experience at this point that I can tell when it happens. Because uh, all of a sudden, when you push on the brake pedal, you start feeling a tick. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get a little kick or a little vibration a little you know, that wasn't there before and only happens under braking. And at that point, you come into the pits, have a pit marshal or whoever's handy kind of take a look and be like, hey, can you look at the left rear and uh, tell me if the rotor's cracked? And they'll be like, oh yeah, it's cracked. And then you pull back in the paddock and hopefully you have a spare to get you home. Ideally, you would want to cycle your rotors before it gets to this point, but yeah, this is what it looks like when you have utterly spent and gotten your money's worth 
out of a rotor. So to illustrate the phase three and a half that I referred to earlier, I have borrowed, uh, <laughs> although I don't think he'll need it back anytime soon, that this isn't from my NSX. This was borrowed from a 2017 GTR, and this particular rotor ring was uh, retired down at Daytona, I believe, recently. But uh, if you imagine this crack, but less spectacular, more of a hairline that you could sort of barely see or that might catch your fingernail just a little bit, uh, but the, the key point is that it wraps around the outside edge. So if you have a crack that actually extends, uh, for drilled rotors, if it extends between any two holes, or if it starts to wrap around for any rotor, if you have a crack that actually extends all the way to the edge, uh, then it's time, to, uh, it's time to retire that rotor. So now that we understand the life cycle of a rotor in general, from new to dead, what can we do to extend that life cycle and get more events and more fun and more bang for our buck out of our rotors? Well, I think the first step is to understand what a rotor actually is. In its most basic form, a rotor is a heat sink. Its entire job involves heating up and cooling down a lot. It turns the kinetic energy of your car going fast into thermal energy or heat, which it then has to dissipate to the atmosphere and cool itself back down to do the job all over again at the next corner. So, <laughs> and then uh, also all of, the, all of the degradation and cracking and failures that you have seen on my brake rotors was due to thermal stress. That is the thermal expansion and contraction through heat cycling that has eventually resulted in a breakdown of the metal, of the, you know, uh, separation of the grains of the metal. Uh, a lot of the time it will happen at an event, actually almost every rotor that I've cracked has happened in an early season or late season event where you have a cooler ambient temperature, which means there's a bigger delta between the hottest that the rotor gets, which in my car's case could be seven or 800 degrees, and the coldest that the rotor could get, which could be you know, 40 degrees F or less. Um, and the speed at which it then contracts uh, it ha I think most of the time that's what's happened is I've, I've come off of a particularly hot session uh, or fast session and, you know, in cold weather and the rotors shrink back down real quick and then you hear a little pink <laughs> and you get out of your car and you have a massive crack in your rotor and it's time to bust the wrenches out. So really extending the life of your rotor is all about managing that heat uh, especially the, the heat difference or the heat delta between the hottest it gets and the coldest it gets. And you can do that a couple of ways. Uh, some ways are more tactical, some ways are more strategic. Strategically, you can use things like brake ducts or brake scoops to manage the peak temperature of the rotor. Uh, and then tactically, you can kind of, you know, make sure you utilize your cool down lap, uh, you know, in colder weather, Normally, you know, on a cool down lap, I try to not use my brakes so they'll cool all the way back down before I get back in the paddock. But maybe in cold weather during a cool down lap, you want to use the brakes a little bit just to kind of extend the time between when they're their hottest and when they're coldest. So it lets them contract back at a slower rate and lessens the likelihood of them being shocked. The other thing you want to avoid uh, if you come off track and it's, uh, you know, let's say it's a day after it's rained or something like that, try to avoid puddles and things like that. Because I've definitely, at least on one occasion, I can distinctly remember hearing that ping right after I drove through a puddle on the way back to my, uh, my paddock space from, the, uh, from pit in. Uh, and so what I had done is I had basically driven, you know, came in hot, or not, probably not too hot, but the rotors were still hot when I came in, drove through a puddle, splashed some water on them, and that was enough of a thermal shock to cause the failure. So, there you go. That's kind of just some quick tips or, uh, or ideas on how to extend the life of your rotors. And uh, maybe you have to buy them less often. But speaking of buying them, that's kind of segues nicely into the last thing I wanted to talk about, which is my philosophy or recommendations, if you will, on how and what rotors to buy. Um, <laughs> so I'll just get my, the way I work out of the way here, and this is not going to work for everybody, but for me, this has been the ticket. And that is I go out and I find the cheapest blank rotors, so no slots, no drilling, that I can find for my car, and I buy a stack of them. And I just kind of understand that they are wear items, 
I'm going to use and abuse them. They're going to split at some point in time, and then I'm going to replace them and throw them out or do something else with them. Um, that may or may not work for everyone, but for me, that's what works. Uh, the you know the the blank rotors, they're the cheapest thing to find. They're easy to find. And they last me on average probably half a season, I'm going to guess. And considering what they cost from my car, which I found them as cheap as $25 per corner, um, the cost benefit from doing it that way and just replacing a bunch of rotors over a longer period of time far outweighs, in my opinion, even if I managed to get two seasons out of, uh, you know, if I went with a big brake kit. So first I would have the expense of a big brake kit to start with, which is for one of these cars, $5,000 or so. If you buy it new, maybe you can find one for $2,500 that somebody's taken off. Um, and then you've got the rings on those, which are a couple of hundred dollars each usually. So I could replace 10 rotors, well, whatever you want to call it, seven to eight rotors, which is probably nearly as many years for me before I have a buyback from replacing one ring on a, uh, on a big brake kit. Now, your mileage may vary. If you have a bigger, heavier car, you may want the bigger diameter rotors for the extra leverage and stopping power. Uh, that can be a thing. Also, bigger rotors are bigger heat sinks. So they're gonna have, be able to handle more thermal input uh, than would the smaller original rotors on an NSX, for instance. The only real recommendation or stay away from that I have are the drilled rotors. Uh, generally speaking, they don't do anything else. Now, we're talking about iron rotors here, not carbon ceramics. Carbon ceramics are their own can of worms. I'm not going to get into that. But uh, you do your own research there because I don't think it makes as much of a difference with those. But with the iron rotors, what I've found from experience from either between myself and, and close friends I know that are, are you know, doing everything else right is that the cross drilling in the rotors, it doesn't really do much other than provide stress points where cracks can, are more likely to start and then also provides little points for them to, you know, for the cracks anyway to propagate between those and cause failures. So generally speaking, I would expect a cross drilled rotor to have the the shortest lifespan of any type of rotor. Uh, if you need something that looks fancy, go with a slotted or a J hook or something like that. Uh, for my purposes, again, it, is, it has been far more economical for me to just use blanks. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, I have never struggled for stopping power in this car as far as an ability to like, uh, you know, go from 100 plus down to whatever is necessary for a turn. And to be honest, I feel like I can keep everything up to a Cayman S pretty dang honest in a braking zone at this point. And that's a pretty modern car with you know wider tires, generally speaking. So that's my spiel on that. That's how I operate. But uh, speaking of operating, I need to get back on putting this car uh, back together, get the brakes bled just a little bit, and then I should be ready to head up to uh, Michigan for that track day next weekend or this coming weekend i guess when i post this video so that is where we're going to leave it today i hope you found the video informative if not entertaining if you did please uh consider subscribing drop a like down below leave a comment with anything you think i missed or got wrong and otherwise uh i will be back so until next time i'm richard this is lap of the world and i will see you guys in the next video if not up at waterford hills